किशोर जूम मल्ली लॉग आउट आई पेंडी नहीं चेंज ना कौन है पैरेलल का तो टाइम नहीं है ना टाइम नहीं है ना टाइम ना कौन है ना पासवर्ड है ना ये पासवर्ड है अरे ये सिक्स ही जी हमारे उसे लेके ना कौन चुनेंगे चलिए सर Okay, fine. Raja, you have to coordinate with Rohit before this. Sir, Lakshmi, what
Barani? Yes, sir. Lakshmutikar, I spoke with uh, Rohit. Connect with Raja after yes. he comes, then invite yeah. him.
प्रसाद कर रहा हूँ प्रसाद कर टेलमिस है सर टेलमिस है क्या क्या पूछा है सारे सम सर सर क्या पूछा Can you make an announcement that will be shortly starting because people are saying sending messages yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in just few minutes Barani yeah hello yes sir uh, just give an announcement will be will be shorting in uh, uh, one minute yeah. in a minute give an announcement yeah uh, good morning all the participants please uh, bear with us within a couple of minutes we will start the webinar thank you for your patience
But I'm not able to tell uh, one minute. Huh? Raja? Sir? Uh, yes, sir. You are connected, I believe. You are not seeing. Can you allow him to come at the panelist? The name, sir. Name. Name, name, sir. Ra Raju, Raju at uh, GBS something is there, no? Sir, can you ask him to ping me uh, ping a message to the group, sir? We could not be able to organize, sir, I think.
Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning to all of you. Good, good, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sadhguru, you can proceed. Yes, sir. Right. 
Barney, go ahead. Uh, good morning, good morning, everyone. And uh, I request uh, uh, Professor C L V R S V Prasad Garu, the principal of GMR Institute of Technology, to deliver welcome address. Good morning, and thank you, Barney. Uh, it's my great privilege and pleasure on behalf of uh, the GMR Varlakshmi Foundation and GMR Institute of Technology uh, uh, to welcome all the dignitaries, guests, and participants uh, uh, for today's webinar on uh, National Education Policy 2020. On this occasion, I'm very much uh, honored and delighted to welcome today's esteemed speaker and uh, a great space scientist, Padma Vibhushan, Dr. K. Asturangan Ji, uh, the chairman uh, NAP committee who immediately accepted our request and agreed to enlighten us by giving the insights of the new education policy and listening to the chairman of the committee directly to understand the true spirit and principles of the policy is a very rare opportunity that one will have. This in turn will enable all the stakeholders of the country in a better way to build the robust education system which will exist for the next two decades. On this occasion, I will just take, uh, uh, I mean, a great pleasure in welcoming our uh, group business chairman, Sri uh, GBS Rajagaru, and also uh, Sri BVN Raugaru, who have accepted to be a part of this webinar. For the quick reference to the guests and participants, I will give a brief background of GMR Valakshmi Foundation and the set contest for today's webinar. GMR Valakshmi Foundation, the CSR arm of the GMR Group of Industries, primarily it works in four major areas, namely community services, skilling and empowerment, health and hygiene, and education at all the locations across the country where the group has its presence in terms of business. Under Education Wing, the foundation runs um, an engineering college by name GMR Institute of Technology, a degree college and a plus two college in the name of Sri Grandi Chanasanya Raju College, and four project schools. And this, uh, among these four project schools, three schools are run by DAV, and one school is run by Chinmaya Mission. Apart from this, the foundation also runs a business school by name GMR Sulik Business School in collaboration with Oak University, Toronto, Canada. Across all the institutions, we have around 9,000 plus students and 400 plus faculty members on the campus. With the spirit of bringing the quality education to the reach of the students in Srikakulam district, Andhra Pradesh, which is the poorest of the poor districts in the country, GMR Varlakshmi Foundation established GMR Institute of Technology and the degree college and plus two college and two colleges in the place called Rajam, at the village, which happens to be the birthplace of our chairman, Sri GM Raugar. So with this background, the GMR of being in the education sector since 1993, the contest has been set to understand the insights of the national education policy, NEP 2020, from the chairman of this committee. So now I, I, I request our business chairman to just to say a few words on this occasion. Dear Kasuri Rangargar, Namaste, sir. I'm Raju here, sir. I'm Raju here, business chairman. My chairman, uh, group chairman, Mr. GMR Garu, has conveyed his uh, personal greetings to you, sir. Namaste. Namaste, Amma. Namaste, uh, everybody. And uh, good morning uh, to everyone, dear uh, Kasturi, Dr. Kasturi Ranganji, uh, dear faculty members and distinguished guests and uh, all attendees. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. And I special thanks to uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan Garu. Uh, education is a key enabler in the evolution of any society and it ensures that all strata of society can make a significant impact in bringing about positive change at all levels. This has a direct socio-economic impact at a societal level, increasing the overall standard of livelihood. India itself has a rich tradition like a Gurukul system, which ensured that education of all students is equitable manner in equitable manner irrespective of their caste social strata and the system is focused on overall development of the students these principles have resulted in several indians establishing themselves as thought leaders with expertise across fields like education science technology research and development and business management and in several fields of expertise we believe that the recently announced national education policy 
2020 transform and upgrade the Indian education system significantly based on its holistic and forward-looking approach. It will bring in a lot of practical learning opportunities, integrate vocational courses, and providing flexibility to students to pursue the disciplines based on their attitude and long-term aspirations. We truly believe that the seamless implementation of National Education Policy 2020 will help us harness and nurture the talent pool existing across the country, pitching India as the largest skilled manpower country in the world. I'm confident that this would also equip all students with the 21st century skills, including creativity, entrepreneurship, critical thinking, and collaboration with a strong emphasis on STEM education and technologies in the new age digital era. We at JMR Varlakshmi Foundation are focused across the entire education life cycle, like from Balwadis to professional degree courses, and believe that post NEP 2020, there will be a higher enrollment percentage, especially in the rural and semi-rural areas. This will enhance the education-based development of rural and semi-rural areas across the country. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Kasturi Ranganji, former chairman of ISRO, who is the head of drafting committee of National Education Policy 2020, to share his thoughts, views, and perspectives on how we can all learn and leverage the NEP 2020 to further the education development across the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for uh, addressing our participants. Uh, it is an honor to introduce uh, Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan, sir. Uh, Dr. Dr. Krishna Swami Kasturi Rangan completed his Bachelor of Science with Honors and Master of Science in Physics from Bombay University and received his doctorate in experimental high energy astronomy in 1971 while working at the physics uh, research laboratory in Daba. His, his interests include astrophysics, space science and technology, as well as science related policies. Dr. Kasturi Rangan was with the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, for over a period of nearly 35 years including nearly 10 years as its chairman from 1994 to 2003. Subsequently, he was a member upper house of the Indian Parliament Rajya Sabha 2003 to 2009 and concurrently the director of National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. Later on, he served as a member of the erstwhile planning commission 2009 to 2014. Dr. Kasturi Rangan was also interested with the task of heading the Karnataka Knowledge Commission as its chairman in 2008 to 2012 and 2013 to 19. More recently, July 2017 to December 2018, he was assigned by the present central government to serve as the chairman of the committee interested with drafting the new national education policy. Dr. Kasturi Rangan presently is the chairman governing board inter-university center for astronomy and astrophysics pune chancellor central university of rajasthan chairperson niit university uh, president current science association bangalore chairman board of governors vikram a sarabhai community science center ahmedabad uh, member atomic energy commission emeritus professor of nias bangalore and honorary advisor of uh, isro dr kasturi rangan was the Satish Dhawan Chair of Engineering Eminence Institute by Indian National Academy of Engineers 2015-17. to He has also occupied important positions in some of the leading academic institutions of India, such as being the Chairman, Board of Governors uh, at Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai, Chairman, Council of uh, uh, Indian Institute of Science, IISC, Bangalore, 2004-15, President Court of IISC, 2015-18, to Chancellor, Jawaharlal Nehru, University New Delhi from 2012 to 2017, Chairman Council of Raman Research Institute, Bangalore 2000 to 2016, among others. Dr. Kasturi Rangan is a member of several international and national science academies, academies including being the fellow of all the four major science and engineering academies of India, among others. He is a member of the International Astronomical Union, fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, Honorary Fellow of the Cardiff University, UK, 
and academician on the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Vatican City. Dr. Kasturi Anjan is the only Indian to be conferred the honorary membership of the International Academy of Astronautics besides being its vice president 2003 to 5. Kasturi Rangan has won several awards, including Brock Medal of International Society of uh, Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing 2004, Alain D. Emil Memorial Award of the International Astronautical Federation 2004, Lifetime Achievement Award of Asia Specific Satellite Communication Council Singapore 2005, Theodore Von Karman Award by International Academy of Astronautics 2007, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in Engineering 1981. Aryabhatta Medal by Indian National Science Academy 2000, Prathindra Puraskar 2002 of Vishwa Bharati Shanti Niketan, Aryabhatta Award of Astronom Astronomical Society of India 2003, Lifetime Award Achievement Award of ISRO 2008, Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Gold Medal 2009 by Indian Science Congress, Desikottam Award 2013 of Vishwa Bharati Shanti Niketan and Haryom Ashram Predit Senior Scientist Award 2016, Physics Research Laboratory. He has also been conferred honorary doctorates from 26 universities or research institutions. Dr. Kasturi Dangan is the recipient of many civilian awards at the state, national, and international level. The prominent ones include the Rajatsava Prashasti, conferred by Government of Karnataka, the highest civilian honors Padma Shri in 1982, Padma Bhushan 1992, and Padma Bhushan, Padma Vibhushan 2000, conferred by President of India and Award of Office of Legion de Honor 2002 by the President of French Republic, France. So I, I welcome Kasturi Dangan, sir, to deliver the lecture on NEP 2020. Thank you, sir. Good morning and thank you for this wonderful remarks. Uh, I would also like to extend my warm greetings uh, to the founder. Uh, to the founder, Mr. G. M. R. Rao, uh, for his vision and farsightedness in creating a very vibrant infrastructure and related institutions contributing to the developmental and economic growth of Andhra Pradesh and also of the country that all these organizations have been created within a span of four decades speaks volumes of the dynamism and efficiency of Mr. G. M. R. Rao and his very close colleagues, Mr. G. B. S. Raju and Mr. Lakshman Mordigaru, who is really laudable. Again, this backdrop, G. M. R. Varlakshmi Foundation has embarked on bringing education into their fold which is definitely an encouraging structure, create quality education manpower for a variety of needs, locally, state-wise, and nationally. I would like to extend my best wishes to Dr. C. L. V. Rao, R. S. V. Rao Prasad, Principal GMRIT, and Dr. J. Raja Morgados, Vice Principal GMRIT. To such an institution and leadership, I'm extremely happy to share my thought about the emerging ideas of the future of higher education in this country. Accordingly, I'll spend the rest of my time in articulating the different aspects of the Indian National Education Policy 2020, which has been adopted by the present government to shape India's education in the coming decades. Now let us look at the relevance of education in the present context. India will have the highest population of young people in the world over the next decade. More than 50% will be below 50, 35 years, aspiring for high quality education. This demographic dividend has to be taken advantage of. Globalization and demands of a knowledge economy and knowledge society call for emphasis on the need for acquisition of new skills by learners on a regular basis for them to learn how to learn and become lifelong learners, a critical consideration to be addressed appropriately. Changes in knowledge landscape, especially science and technology advances like big data analytics, machine learning, 
artificial intelligence or demand skilled workforce involving mathematics, computer science, data science, as well as multidisciplinary abilities across sciences, social sciences, and humanities. The education of future needs to be reconfigured in order to meet the goals of global education development agenda. Goal four of the Sustainable Development Goals 4 of 2030 that seeks to ensure inclusion and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning uh, for opportunities for all. I shall briefly delve upon this, how we went about this uh, since this committee was formed. We had the members of the policy committee, which was constituted by the then Minister of Education uh, Mr. Prakash Javdekar, asking us to now come out with a, a, a policy framework uh, that will guide the India's education. Uh, the members of the drafting committee, of course, were drawn from different areas, whether it is related to science, arts, humanities, educationists, policy makers, and even mathematicians. We had uh, Professor Manjul Bhargav, a professor from Princeton, uh, who came over specially for being a part of this particular committee. We also had a members of a technical secretariat to service this committee. And most importantly to us, even though we formulate this policy to give an objective review of this policy, we also created a set of peer reviewers who are well known for their contribution to the field of education and policy, but who are not a part of formulating this policy at all. So what is the process we adopted? Discussions and consultation with different stakeholders including organizations, institutions, and individuals. This we started somewhere in July 2017 onwards. Previous policy documents were very extensively used, documentation from ground level consultations, submissions from individuals and group. I may mention these were all part of the preparatory work that was done by the Ministry of at that time the Ministry of Human Resource and Development even before our committee was formed. So there was an enormous amount of background material that was available to us uh, to study and assimilate as a part of formulating the present policy. The public time on Toronto, of course, having done this, having submitted a, having submitted a draft policy, the government, the present government, chose it to put it in the public domain to make sure that the public is aware of this policy and they wanted to draw opinions from the various segments of the society. So over two and a half lakh opinions were made available uh, through this kind of a public response uh, step. And uh, this was again was analyzed by the uh, Ministry of Human Resources in the context of seeing what kind of new things the public would like to do beyond what we have done. But I should say that nearly 78 to 80% of the recommendations that we have made were endorsed by the responses from the public domain. Consultation with state education authorities was another important step. After all, education is a concurrent subject. So we had to make sure that we had discussions with the state government education authorities and look at their opinion with respect to the formulation of this policy. Reviews of policy document at the level of honorable premises is one of the things. Once we submitted this, when we got all the inputs from public domain, when we completed the consultations with the state government authorities and educational authorities, at the final stages, when we had a near final document, this was subjected to a very thorough review by the honorable prime minister. I want to, I want to say this because the prime minister had three to four sittings on this. In fact, some of the sittings he spent hours discussing the various nitty gritty details of the policy and made sure that this policy is pragmatic and is appropriate in the context of India's uh, developing ambitions as a knowledge society. So he went into each one of the items of the policy to make sure that it's the right type of recommendation and that he is satisfied with it. Of course, we subsequently had after this review at the level of Honorable Prime Minister, major conferences with vice chancellors Vice chancellors and other high level functionaries convened by the Honorable Prime Minister, and later on also Rashtrapati Ji, His Excellency the President of India, conducted a few reviews uh, with the chancellors and other high level functionaries in the context of reviewing this document. So, that is the situation at which we are today. Right now, the work is in progress with respect to how do we want to now implement it, the steps that we need to take up, the phasing that we need to do 
and the type of resources that we want to deploy. So these are the present actions that are currently in progress. And what I would like to say is to bring the audience up to date with respect to the present status or the details that are there in the policy, which are to be implemented subsequently by both the state and the central government. Now let us look at the framework of the policy document. How does a policy overarching, so the overarching statement with regard to how the character of the policy, the policy provides an integrated yet flexible approach to education. Further, it has kept the interconnectedness of the various phases of education in mind and how the same will enable continuity, coherence and processes to ultimately realize an end-to-end -end educational roadmap for the country. And though there is no break, there is nothing like an educational roadmap where individual areas could be taken out as silos and could be connected. There is an interconnection and this interconnection provides for an end-to-end -end kind of a roadmap uh, with respect to starting with school education right up to the highest levels in research and so on. An articulation of a broad view of education encompassing the holistic development with special emphasis on kindling of the creative potential of each individual in all its richness and complexity has grown increasingly popular in recent years, it's not only in our country, but elsewhere too. The policy thus aims at the development of the 21st century skills for the students while giving enough flexibility in making choices consistent with the dynamics of a knowledge society. Thus, the policy recognizes the interconnectedness of the various phases of the education. And in this context, I would like to give a brief set of comments on the school education, because school education is of intrinsic importance on, on one side, and how a student experiences the school phase of education could have a significant influence on those who subsequently pursue higher education, besides, of course, helping to lay the foundation for lifelong learning. So let me just give you a picture of what the configuration of the school education is. I'd like to say that the extent 10 plus 2 structure in the school education now is recommended in the policy to be modified with a new pedagogical and curricular restructuring, which will be a school education uh, spanning over 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 years. This is the five year for a few years and these four phases in the school education is recommended to be executed uh, for the learners at the school level. Uh, I'm just giving you the thing. The first point is a foundational level. The policy recognizes there are individual differences, the cognitive development of the children. I want to say foundational thing comes mainly because of the fact there have been several important developments in cognitive sciences, neural sciences and things of that kind, which gives an insight into the child's brain growth. I would like to say that by the age of eight, the child has virtually has 85% of his brain already matured. So the question is, by the age of eight, we have to take full advantage of the ability of the brain to absorb new ideas, able to learn and able to make judgments. So these kind of characteristics of the brain's evolution is something that we have seriously considered in formulating the first five years of education. We call this as the foundational period. It's a three year in pre-primary school and two years class one and two. These are the first five years. They start the education at the age of three instead of the present age of six. And from three to eight is this foundational phase. So there are two characteristics of the foundational phase, which is critical. One is the ability the fact that we address the question of the evolution of the brain uh, over the, the evolution of the brain over the first 80 years with respect to the brain growth and recognizing this aspect of it. And the second point is every child has its own trajectory of brain growth. And therefore, we have to make sure there is a attention to be paid at the individual level for these children. So these are the two elements that go with the foundational thing, something which was not considered in the earlier policies, but we recognize this as an important area simply because of the fact that we understand today the brain growth and its trajectory 
much better than what it was known at the time the previous formal policies were formulated. So having gone through the first five years in the foundational phase, the child gets into the next three years where you start bringing in the curricular structure, standardization, and things of that kind. But in a broader context of learning and writing and things of that kind, this takes us to the next middle level where we go for more structured learning from age 11 or so to age 14, where we start learning subjects, we interact more with the teachers, try to understand the concepts at the abstract level and things of that kind. So you have a beginning which is conceptual, perceptual, then you go into the conceptual level, then you go into um, the, the, the prescriptive level, and finally you go into understand the abstractive ideas uh, that are part of a higher educational aspect of a school education. So that is the middle school. And finally, all these, at, at, by the age of 14, leads to the secondary level, which is a four-year period, where you bring in the multidisciplinary orientation with exit often. The most important aspect is this will prepare the student on one side to be knowledge sufficiently knowledgeable to pursue a profession at the end of the secondary school education. It could be vocational, it could be certain type of professional things. And on the other side, it can also prepare the student for the undergraduate program, including early introduction to liberal arts education. I'll come back to the liberal arts education a little later. So you can see the present four phases of school education is developmentally appropriate, addresses the growth pattern of the brain of the child, and making sure that we take maximum advantage of this great part of growth pattern in trying to create those of the curricular and pedagogical structure that will enable the student to understand at the appropriate age the appropriate thing and therefore much more effective in terms of learning uh, process that we need to impart to the child. Now I go, this is, I just thought that I will introduce this aspect of the school education more for the continuity as I mentioned earlier. And also equally importantly, it's a very new con a set of ideas that we have brought in mainly because of our better understanding of the science of brain and the brain evolution. Now we go to the most important aspect in the higher education part of it, and this is undergraduate education. Uh, the undergraduate education here, uh, I'm trying to touch it with respect to the strategy we have recommended, one of holistic education. The policy aims to promote holistic and multidisciplinary education at the undergraduate level to generate more imagination and creativity in students to ensure their all-rounded development. So this is one of the important things, the whole idea of a multi holistic and multidisciplinary education is to kindle imagination and creativity in the student. The concept is also called as a liberal education. The integrated, holistic and multidisciplinary education is also what is known as a liberal education. It is an age-old idea in the Indian context. I mean, should mention this. In Bana Bhatta's Kadambari, for example, is one of the longest and old oldest novels ever written by anybody, but this talks much about education. A person was recognized as a truly educated when he mastered the 64 kalas, arts, encompassing music, dance, painting, sculpture, languages, and literature, in addition to subjects such as science, engineering, and mathematics, as well as vocational subjects such as carpentry and things of that kind. Liberal education explores the remarkable relationship. This, this is very important to note. The remarkable relationship that exists among the sciences and humanities, mathematics and art, medicine and physics, etc. And more generally, the surprising unity of all fields of human endeavor. So that is what the crux of the liberal education is. A comprehensive liberal education, therefore, develops all capacities of human beings, intellectual, aesthetics, social, physical, emotional, and moral in an integrated manner. So this is what the background of a liberal education is, the holistic and integrative. And as a crucial step to lead India into the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution, therefore, multidisciplinary education is central. Even engineering schools such as yours, such as the IITs, will move 
towards more holistic multidisciplinary education with more arts and humanities mm -hmm. you try to bring this already there are a lot of discussion on stem steam and so on and so forth while arts and humanities students will aim to learn more science while all will try to make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills india's rich legacy in the arts as well as in the sciences and beyond will significantly help in making the move towards an education and opportunities of this type an easy and natural transition and give a little more details <clears throat> of what this education eleven education is with respect to the undergraduate program first of all when we talk about undergraduate program liberal education we are really talking of imaginative and flexible curricular structures creative combinations of disciplines of study multiple exit and entry options and master and doctoral education to provide research based specializations the 3 to 4 year undergraduate degree currently the undergraduate degree we are they are recommending a 4 year undergraduate degree with multiple options include a 4 year program where undergraduate degree encompassing liberal arts education in chosen major and minor vocational subject or even on professional education is what is recommended as the the, the four year component which is the total component with regard to an undergraduate education one can also have consistent with the existing system of three year program we have recommended that there is a provision for the bachelor's degree can be obtained but a three year program and there is that appropriate curricular structure as the pedagogy to be drawn up for the same both the third and fourth year program lead to degree with honors with research work so there is a provision in the third and fourth year of undergraduate education to also encourage research after all the research is more than producing papers it creates originality and creativity among the few youngsters this is an important component of a training that they need to be given even at the undergraduate level and finally we can have an exit even at the end of two years of undergraduate education a diploma can be given or a one year when a certificate can be given so the exit exists for the first year second year third year and fourth year and these exits are made in such a way that the corresponding curricular structures provide certain type of opportunities in jobs and other kinds of activities if you want to leave at any point in the undergraduate education finally it also provides in the flex masters degree program a two year for those with the three year undergraduate degree a one year for those with the four year undergraduate degree with honors and an integrated five year program itself that can lead to masters so there is a flexibility in also the master degree program uh, with respect to uh, the number of years that they need to spend under different circumstances of how they did in the undergraduate education now the next important thing is i said about the holisticity and the integrative nature of the education so here is another important area how do we integrate the professional education into the mainstream education regarding the integration of professional education with general education the policy aims to take a holistic approach to the preparation of professionals by ensuring broad based competencies an understanding of the social human context a strong ethical compass in addition to the highest quality professional capacities so there are the present professional education fall short of many of these kind of requirements of being a total professional so that's where we are try to bring in more completeness to the professional education and the recommendation is that the professional education should have to have a large component of the general education and so there is an integration that is needed between the professional education and the mainstream education and bring a holisticity and integration at uh, the education level in the professional uh, subjects all institutions offering either professional or general education finally have to organically evolve into multidisciplinary institutions offering both by 2030 this is one of the key elements of the recommendation that we have made in trying to make sure that there is an organic ultimately organic evolution 
between the professional education and the general education towards a more multidisciplinary education. The overall higher education sector, therefore, will aim to be an integrated higher education system, including professional and vocational education. Thus, this approach will be applicable to all higher educational institutions across current streams, which will eventually merge into one coherent ecosystem of higher education. Now, let us look at the research component. Uh, I, I just move to another major recommendation, which is related to catalyzing the quality academic research in all the fields. Then what we are trying to do is to recommend a national research foundation, which is to provide the necessary institutional framework to support research activities uh, on a wider scale than ever imagined currently. I may like to mention that the research and innovation leading to knowledge creation is central to growing and sustaining a large and vibrant economy uplifting the society. The robust ecosystem of research is today more relevant than ever in the context of climate change or population dynamics, biotechnology, expanding digital marketplace, and the rise of medicine, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Example, I would like to quote a little bit to see the effectiveness of the research, how it has contributed uh, to the economics of many of the countries. And here is an example for the European Union, which estimates that two thirds of the economic growth of Europe during 1995 to 2007 came from research and innovation. The research and innovation accounted for 15% of all productivity gains, 2000 to 2013, this is the period in which this estimate has been made and that an annual increase of 0.2% of GDP in R&D investment would result in an annual increase of 1.1% in GDP, a five-fold return. So one can see the effectiveness for a well-orchestrated and managed research and development program. And that's precisely what we have recommended and the formation of a National Research Foundation. If you look at India's present research and innovation investment of about 0.7% is a 2014 number, needs to be compared with the corresponding figures of 2.8%, this is US, or 4.3% of Israel, or 4.2% of South Korea, at least three times the proportion of GDP. That is the kind of investment that many of these countries are doing and who are now known to produce several innovations and ideas and products and services from them with respect to the research and development outcomes. This low level of investment in our case has meant that the number of researchers in India per lakh of population is only 15 per lakh. This is related to four, nearly 400 in US or 800 in Israel. So one can see the gap today between the number of researchers in India and with the similar research activities in other countries. Other attendant impacts, of course, therefore, will be if you, because of the lower research people, number of research people, lower research activity. So there are lower levels of patent applications and also the value of quality publication certainly is another area which has been affected. So that is where we have made a recommendation with regard to the creation of a National Research Foundation. It has a strong emphasis on catalyzing and energizing research and innovation across the country in all academic disciplines with particular focus on state universities and colleges. We think these are areas, these are the institutions that do need attention now in the future to create vibrant research communities. A fund to seed research in all universities and colleges so that synergies between research and quality education can be leveraged maximally this is the kind of a fund that will come out of the National Research Foundation. NRF will fund research across all disciplines and significantly expand research and innovation at all universities and colleges, including private institutions. We have not made a distinction between private and public institution regarding research funding in this. The quality of the research proposals, peer, peer review and evaluation the decision with respect to the type of outcome expected is the kind of parameters that will come into picture in deciding what who will receive the funding 
it is not based on whether it is a public funded institution or privately supported institution. NRM will have the provision to cover many themes. So I normally when we talk of research, even today, we talk of science, technology, engineering, and so on. NRM very much widens the scope of entire research activity and the corresponding funding. Research is in tech science, technology, social sciences, arts, and humanities, and many more will be all covered by the National Research Foundation. The scope of the work, I know you, 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 many of you are quite familiar, funding research through a competitive peer review based process, building research capacity at academic institutions across the country through mentorship of submitting proposals and for conducting research, creating beneficial linkages between researchers, government and industry, disseminating research through seminars and awarding prizes to outstanding researchers. Now I move to another area, which is the energized, engaged, and capable faculty. The most important factor for the success of higher education institution is the quality and engagement of its faculty. This policy puts faculty back at the heart of higher education. Rampant practice of contractual appointments, contract and ad hoc, especially clock hour basis, will be phased out. Very heavy teaching loads need to be rationalized to give faculty time to invest in themselves. Infrastructure support. Most faculty do not even have staff rooms in many of the institutions. One can know I mean, is aware of this. Faculty recruitment and development plans, career progression, and compensation management to be a part of every institutional development plan announced by the higher educational institutions. Appropriately designed permanent employment is a tenure track system to be in place in all institutions by 2030. Faculty will be having a certain high level of autonomy, empowered to make curricular choices and conduct assessment of students. Infrastructure for continuous professional development for all faculty, they will be strengthened. Appropriately designed bridge courses for mid-career professionals to get into teaching will be the other aspect of a provision that has been reflected in this policy. Teacher education, this policy, this is another important thing I want to bring more because of the fact that here is where the connection comes between school education and the higher education institution. What we have tried to recommend here is that this ensure rigorous school teacher preparation even for schools within a vibrant multidisciplinary institution, we need to create the necessary provisions. School teacher preparation will be done at multidisciplinary universities. Departments of education will be set up in many universities to offer a four-year integrated state-specific Bachelor of Education degree. The Bachelor of Education will be an undergraduate program of study covering both disciplinary and pedagogic teacher preparation courses for each stage of education, foundational to secondary. All subjects, including arts, sports, vocational education, special education, they will be all mainstream. On par with the other undergraduate degrees, graduates of the four-year program will be eligible for master's and PhD programs that can be, can be in education or in other areas. Current two-year Bachelor of Education program will continue until 2030. After 2030, only those institutions offering a four-year teacher education program within the higher educational institution can offer the two-year program. The two-year program will be used for lateral entry of subject teachers, specifically specially designed courses in pedagogy for mid-career professional to become faculty will also be introduced. And most importantly, one is aware of the TEIs and other kinds of institution, substandard and dysfunctional teacher education institutes will have to be shut down. So let us look at the educational technology. One of, one of the important things that we have tried to look at is to see in the use of technology in the context of education and the type of, uh, of supplementing and complementing role uh, such a technology can provide 
in enhancing the education. So here I have tried to put, to appropriately integrate the technology at all levels of education, what we need to do. The use of technology in education falls into four broad categories, improving teaching, learning, and evaluation, supporting teacher preparation and continuous teacher professional development, enhancing educational access to disadvantaged groups, streaming education, planning, administration, and management. And for all these, teacher training in educational technology is also equally important. Now, how educational technology can improve the education system? I mean, there is a crisis like COVID-19 currently, and which you are all familiar with. The online education, whether it is in synchronous mode, live interactions, and a synchronous mode, blending high-quality pre-recorded statement, rapid feedback with automated smart evaluation, example, the artificial intelligence. These are the things improving teaching, it's learning, and evaluation kind of a thing. This is, these are the kind of things one can give a little more detail. On the other side, recommender systems for content and certification. This is a teacher supporting preparation and continuous teacher professional development. This becomes an important part. When you go to the enhancing educational access to disadvantages, connect the few specialized teachers to virtual classrooms of learners with specific needs must address the digital divide. This, this is one of the key elements currently that is a constraining factor uh, with respect to the type of role that enhancing teacher access to disadvantage group can be brand with, by using the educational technology. And finally, streaming education, planning, administration, and management. This is a major area on which currently already many institutions follow this. The National Repository of Educational Data to track progress in achieving educational code is a major recommendation that has come out of this aspect of it. In all these, I would like to emphasize that the teacher training in educational technology is critical and the necessary provision has to be made with respect to how do you bring in an educational system where the teacher will get it automatically as a part of their career. Towards this, one of the important recommendations that we have tried to do is to create a new National Educational Technology Forum, NETF, which should be set up with the following is the role of this kind of an NETF, National Education Technology. It will provide an independent evidence-based advice to central and state government on the adoption of technology-based intervention. I want to say this because there are several technologies that are available the choices had to be made, the appropriateness of those choices had to be evaluated, and there could be also other fallouts for the choice of wrong technologies on the areas of social, cultural, and other aspects of it. So one has to be very careful, critical, and candid about the choice of technologies. That is one of the reasons why we want a forum where this can be fully evaluated and provide evidence-based advice to central and state government. They would also help to build an intellectual and institutional capacities in education technology. I mentioned in the previous slide about the importance of this activity. To envision strategic trust areas in the technology domain and to promote education in them among the educational institutions. So this is another kind of a thing. The most important, of course, is to articulate new directions for research and innovation and the use of technology for improving educational outcomes. The important thing is this is mainly a very highly deliberative body. Institutions of higher education certainly can set up certain component of this kind of a forum, which will work with the national system of what you call as an integrated educational technology forum, and try to get the best of the ideas exchanged, experiences exchanged, new ideas discussed, and also develop the direction or envision the strategic trust areas, as I mentioned, with regard to the technology domain. So these are all part and parcel of in this new forum that we have recommended in the context of ensuring that we have the right type of technology introduced into the educational system in the right places. And we have an Indianness coming out of this kind of a thing for various other aspects of cultural and social factors. NETF will maintain a regular flow of authentic data from multiple sources, including educational technology innovators and practitioners, 
particularly at the grassroots level. <laughs> the disruptive, I also don't want to leave the discussion on the technology without mentioning about the disruptive technologies. If I remember, if you recall, the 1986 1992 policy could not expect the international disruption. So that was one of the things that the current policy, after 30 years of the last policy, certainly has taken cognizance of. This policy fully expects the educational system to face many technological disruption, whether it is artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual reality, and things of that kind. Two major aspects related to such disruptive technology. One will be harnessing the technology to improve the educational outcome. Example, the human plus artificial intelligence hybrid interactive learning system. On the other side, education in new and disruptive technology, identifying them and preparing students in large numbers. This policy, never, if you go through them, it addresses both these aspects. Now I come to a very important area which is of interest to many of the higher educational institutions, uh, both private as well as public funded. And this is on empowering the governance and autonomy in the higher educational institutions. The policy recognizes that effective governance and leadership is the key for creation of a culture of excellence and innovation in higher educational institutions. All higher educational institutions in the next 15 years, I'm meaning, will become autonomous, self-governing entities through a system of graded accreditation and graded autonomy. With appropriate graded accreditations, such institutions shall establish a board of governors consisting of highly qualified and competent individuals with proven capabilities and a strong sense of commitment. The Board of Governors will be empowered to govern the institution free of any external interference, make all appointments, including that of the head of the institution, and take all decisions regarding the governors. The BOG will be responsible and accountable to the stakeholders through transparent and self-disclosures of all relevant records. BOG to develop a strategic institutional development plan, IDP, long term, which is 10 to 15 years, medium term, which could be five years, and a short term, which could be one to three years, based on which institutions can develop educational and research outcomes, parameters for quality and capacity, and improve organizational, financial, and human resource development plan to assess. In a nutshell, the governance and autonomy does provide for the autonomy and autonomy not only in administration, but also in academics, and most importantly, also in finances. So this is the direction in which all the institutions will move. Our recommendation is that this should happen among all the existing higher educational institutions, both private and public, in the next 15 years to move into this kind of a self-governing autonomous system with quality and other criteria being the key element uh, for evaluation. I may mention now, before I conclude, that uh, the cabinet approval was given on this particular uh, policy with respect to July 29, 2020. And I did mention about many steps that have gone into it in terms of presentation and health discussions, webinars, and things of that kind. This is the period in which a lot of discussions are currently in progress among the various institutions, individuals, policy makers, and also others. Primarily because of the fact, I think, a familiarity with the multiple dimensions of this policy at this stage, at every level, and with everyone who is concerned with the education, I think is a must. I think we are taking that time now, uh, using the opportunity of a certain gap as we try to plan the national curricular network, curricular framework at the state level and the central level, at the school education and higher education, and many other things on which the legal structures have to be brought in and so on and so forth. Even as we try to look at all those areas, there is enough time for a set of discussion, enough time for sensitization, enough time for briefing, and most importantly, discuss the various strategies. And strategies we do know, institution to institution, it can vary. It can vary between state to state, district to district, and so on and so forth. And there could be differences between the way the central government institutions are supported with respect to the state government. I would like to say that the overall framework uh, with respect to the implementation certainly would be in place 
not in a very different future, maybe in the next few months. And already school have come out with specific directions with respect to what they would like to do in the next two years or so. The important aspect I would like to say to this August Standardite audience is the fact that we have given quite a lot of importance to uh, pub, uh, private uh, um, uh, investments into education and the type of flexibility that they would be looking for. This is one aspect of it. The second, the philanthropic nature of uh, funding that will come forward from publicly spirited organizations and individuals certainly is another welcome direction in which the funding can be thought about. This is besides the central government funding. And lastly, one can also think of alumni related funding. This is an area in which the country is not very much developed in terms of you know, try, trying to uh, mobilize the alumni strength in the context of finances and even on management and things of that kind. So these are things which need to be thought about. It has to be done locally. It has to be done at the institutional level, at the level of state, as well as in the central government. But uh, we are sure that this is something that will move now shortly and uh, we should see a transformed India so far as the education and knowledge society is concerned. And I would like to use this opportunity uh, to thank the GRM, GMR group of industries and its founder, last year's founder, Mr. GMR Rao, uh, for this unique opportunity to give my own thoughts and share my own views on this particular uh, policy. I'm sure institutions like yours have a lot of Role, a critical role to play in respect of transforming India uh, through the policy framework that we have presented to the country and with the present government has adopted and is fully behind us with respect to supporting this policy uh, for implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, elaborative and comprehensive. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the detailing on uh, national education policy. So before we go ahead for the uh, looking at the the chat box and other uh, Q and A uh, uh, session, uh, I would like to request our uh, group uh, business chairman uh, Sri J V S Ragaru and then uh, B N Garu to have some reflections on this before we go ahead, sir. Okay. Saru, uh, thank you, Kasuri Rangan Garu, and it is a very uh, I think it's a great uh, thing, sir, and uh, really emphasizing on. Uh, research and innovation and also really a flexible education looking into the our uh, uh, economy and also the various facet of our country the way we are uh, uh, structured as a country you know uh, and uh, the whole education policy structuring it out and giving it a lot of flexibility to the students is very uh, interesting sir and I think uh, the new education policy will uh, grow our uh, country and also our economy and uh, and I strongly believe that you know uh, we as a country will be the strong workforce to the entire world and uh, I think you know this is a very good uh, webinar and thank you for your time sir uh, Kastri Garu and uh, uh, Bhivan Garu you have any points I think uh, you can go ahead with the Q&A session Prasad Garu. Yes sir thank you sir so thank you very much sir uh, uh, now I uh, request uh, Barani uh, to just to consolidate some of the queries uh, that have come from uh, the participants across and then uh, so that we can just have uh, the reflections from our guest today's guest uh, in uh, answering some of the, uh, the few questions yes sir uh, so there are there are many questions sir, around 30 to 40 questions have been asked by participants uh, however we will restrict to the questions which are very much relevant to this NAP. and you can group uh, them you can group yes. them so that yes. you can have a, 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 some a consolidated uh, remarks uh, from the uh, speaker. Yes, yes, yes. yes, sir. yes. Uh, the, the common question what most of the students, most of the participants have asked about what will be the major impact as far as the primary education is concerned. Sir. The primary education at the school level? Yes, sir. Primary education. Yes, sir. School level, sir. See, the most important thing I mentioned was the the foundational component of the uh, school uh, school level education, which is spread over five years, starting from the age three of the child to the stage eight. Now, this is a very important part of the primary education. And of course, another three years when the child starts learning, uh, the, the broad ideas of 
uh, uh, broad ideas of learning a certain knowledge base, but without distinction of subjects or things of that kind. But the first five years, what we call at the foundational level, is very much dependent on how well we understand a child, its growth, brain, brain growth, and how do we respond to that brain growth. And as I said, in the trajectory of the brain growth of individual children in this period of the primary education is not uniform, it's not a linear function. We need to make sure that we identify the growth pattern of individual children, look at their strengths and weaknesses, and make up a prescription for those kind of changes and weaknesses. So there is an elaborate procedure we need to evolve in the first five years of foundational thing. If we don't create the foundational numeracy and literacy period at this particular five years, then we are going to lose out in terms of the ability of the child to comprehend some of the more advanced ideas because the foundation is not sufficient. And this foundation cannot be recreated at the later stage because the brain has already grown. I said, by the age of eight, you are already, the brain growth is already 85% of the total. So this is very clear that we need to create a new set of curricular structure, the new pedagogical approaches, the teachers who are familiar with this kind of a requirement and a large fusion between the Anganwadi system, the present, the present preschool systems, as well as the primary school system. I think we need to bring the fusion to have an end-to-end -end kind of a connection and taking due recognition of the developmental characteristics of the child with respect to his ability to comprehend and understand uh, specific ideas. So this is going to be one of the key elements, but this is not a, something which is very difficult. Many, many countries have followed this. Many of them have very well succeeded. And in our case, it's imperative simply because currently five crores of youngsters are out of education. Primarily because they don't have the necessary numeracy and literacy functions understood. And if we neglect this numeracy and literacy by not doing the primary and early education properly, the early childhood care and education, ECCE, then we are going to lose another five, five crores in the another five years or 10 years. We cannot afford this. We cannot have a large illiterate, illiterate population because we are overlooking something which is now very clear to us what to do. And therefore, we have got a very special prescription of how to, first of all, to, bring, to, 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 bring, to identify the trajectory of learning to who will do this uh, 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 process of teaching and interaction and whether we draw also community people, people from the higher classes, bright youngsters coming and teaching in the lower classes. There are several such prescriptions we have identified in the school education, both at the foundational and preschool, primary school level. I think they should be carefully studied. The policies will naturally have to be converted into both a curricular framework, which I understand is under preparation by 2020, 2021, we will have the school curricular framework and that curricular framework then has to be adopted by the states with respect to their school curriculum as well as the pedagogy. And then the teachers have to be oriented. In our view, I think it takes about six months for the student and the teacher to get familiar with the newer dimensions of the teaching and the pedagogy that they need to take uh, but it's workable, so we need to move towards that kind of a thing. And good amount of description is there in the report. And uh, of course, a curricular framework is the next important step. Once the curricular framework is I said, go towards curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is regarding uh, the language of instructions uh, in the schools. So, is it uh, is it uh, like uh, in the new NEP? Is there any scope for native languages? Uh, what is the scope? Is there any emphasis has been given for the native languages apart from the English? Yes, I, I think what I want to say something about this aspect of it because I think the people have a tendency to interpret it in different ways. This is this is actually a three language formula which was earlier there in the earlier policy number one. Now, if you ask me. What is the difference between that three language formula which was there earlier in the Kodari <coughs> Commission and the present three language formula? One, we make sure that the languages are taught right from the age three, not from age six, as it is in the present system. So that is one. The second, 
is the language can be mother tongue home language or local language and finally regional language so you can go for that kind of a flexibility which didn't exist in the earlier language formula so it really expands the scope of the choice of languages in the early phase of learning uh, this thing so that is the second part of it though there is a flexibility there and there is an early learning there these are the two different elements which has been brought into this new policy compared to the older policy otherwise the older policy of a three language formula will continue this is first point the second thing is that you need if you need to talk of three languages one is of course you need a mother tongue you need otherwise a home, home language and the, or it can it just be local language because this is one on now the, the way this will come is the fact that you have also the issues of a child knowing a particular language and the teacher knowing a language which is not necessarily the language that the, child, the student knows so you need to create that kind of a thing so we have a provision in the thing as to how to deal with this kind of a, a difference between the spoken language of the teacher or the writing language of the teacher and the youngster so there is a pro pro policy provision for that the second the second aspect is so there is a provision for studying the local language or the language the spoken at home or those kind of a thing but we need to make provisions for it because the, the, the question is easier said than done but we need to bring and for that you need adequate number of youngsters interested in the language and therefore you get the correct critical number of teachers for that so this has to be mapped with respect to different locations and so but the policy does not prevent you from doing this the when you talk of a home language or a low mother mother tongue or the local language it does cover the type of questions or concerns that you have with respect to this the other the other other aspect is learning of english even if you learn your mother tongue or the local language and this and you also learn one language of india outside this so that one language which is spoken anywhere in india is a second language you should learn the third language is again your choice and if you want to learn english right from the age 3 and you want to learn it all through you have all the freedom to learn it there is nobody who is going to come in the way of learning english as a part of a language formula itself so providing for learning of language language english providing for the language which is one of the languages of india which is so beautiful it's important to learn language not only the 18 language of the schedule um, uh, schedule 18 but also are many other classical languages and so on we have made provision for that kind of thing and lastly of course the mother tongue or the local language or home, home language this is also there so i think between the three it covers all the aspects of a language requirement for learning the early phase of the education i don't think that and there is enough for the broader thing is that there should be a critical mass in terms of an interest to learn among the children in the local area and you should be able to immediately create the necessary teaching support for them but i think both are still possible because simply because language is something i only want to say that the language policy is much broader than this in the policy itself there is the question of um, learning languages uh, beyond uh, the, the regular languages of india which is the state wise languages you have also classical languages we are recommended areas like sanskrit pali um, and classical telugu classical tamil classical kannada and things of that kind malayalam and so there are several such things also we are recommended since we are getting into the internationalization we have put emphasis on learning some of the foreign languages because this also is if you look at these areas the current provisions of language learning in the country is much less to be desired, desired now we need to bring in a much bigger effort to create language institutions research institutions translation institutions and many other kinds of thing which will ultimately promote language in its many forms and this country being rich and i want to i don't want to enter emphasize beyond a point the sanskrit uh, language is so rich in its contents that it exceeds the total literary literary content or the literature content of both the latin and the greek so you can see how 
how vast the language of sanskrit is how beautiful it is how well structured how scientific it is so these are questions which has not been appreciated in the learning process and we have gone into the details of these and made specific recommendations on those kind of things so there is a higher level of learning indian languages there is a functional requirement of the three language formula and also the international requirements in terms of languages of other countries so on all the three things we have very clear direction with respect to the policy uh thank you sir so one question uh, most of the participants are interested in is about nrf uh, uh, national research foundation so currently there are very few uh, institutes or few phd scholars are involved in industry academia collaborations so whether this new nep will uh, will enhance those collaborations more like industry and academia as far as the phd uh, research is concerned is yes, very much actually the national research foundation uh, uh, is a result of a discussion where <laughs> we considered the very weak research base in our present university system uh, especially about 900 and odd universities if you really look at it at the state level particularly you have not much of a research which is worth i have mentioned the, the number of researchers per lakh and things like that these are only the uh, indicators but the important thing is we don't we are not a country which have been very strong in the reserve we have got very bright youngsters who are excellent scientists you got very good papers they have been published but 10% of the pure research work is very good but there is much to be done with respect to the points you made the applied research translation research industrial research and research for other requirements like social uh, requirements as well as strategic requirement in these areas an end to end effort producing results which are indigenous in terms of technology or ideas or products i think is yet to come out substantially and that is where both the question of how much we invest in it how much you promote this how do you create an institution for promoting it these are question we have they are all inadequate whether it is finance whether it is infrastructure is the right type of people available for doing this and if they are there how do you connect them with respect to industry and other stakeholders these are questions which we have addressed to the national research so national research foundation for the first time will focus on the overall outcomes of the research by creating institutional mechanism as the university yet with respect to centers of excellence and in creating the centers of excellence we would like to see the expertise of several people who have grown over years who have now withdrawn from their parent institution but who are still available who are very active and whose mind is still very alert with respect to the kind of strategy we need to adopt for creating centers of excellence so we need to draw their expertise try to create the centers of excellence in the universities try to create connectivity with the local institution whether it is related to hospitals whether it is health whether it is related to industry whether it is related to other areas like transport environment and things like that and so there is a whole variety of topics on which the research programs can be defined and the local institutions could be one area and also where there are industries which are available there can be a two way process of an interaction with an industry we have also mentioned about that part of it one is to make sure that the industry provides the necessary support Uh, in terms of uh, using their major facilities for conducting certain aspects of research on with investment has not taken place in the educational institution the second is industry identifies certain type of research topics with the local institutions or the institution around or even no institution away can undertake a program and undertake a research uh, activity is the second part of it third is the part that where the fundamental research will be still done by the universities kind of a thing and government or public funding can be there but more important the moment it moves into an applied research and a translation research we have a policy to work together between the university institution and the industry 
so that they can move over the account, out outcome of the applied research or translation research into products and services. So this entire thing needs to be set up. This is precisely the objective of the National Research Foundation. The culture has to be created and the number, the scaling has to be done in a much wider thing than what is currently there. And therefore, this is accepted as a very special recommendation. I understand that this is being even directed from the Prime Minister's office. The importance of the research is so much that they are being directed from the Prime Minister's office. So there is a direction for this. And certainly the National Research Foundation not only gives you, even if you are a private institution, the money, it gives you an opportunity to work with men and institutions who can support you to create standards of excellence. The provisions exist in connecting this with the local industries or industries elsewhere, which where there are certain areas of outcome that they are expecting from a research. The indigenous technology therefore can be further enhanced and even new technologies can get into the market. So this is a very wide ranging uh, uh, opportunity uh, for people to initiate and pursue research with very much focused end goals, which is the most important aspect of it. Whereas paper production can continue still. These are by and large substantially going to be in the applied and translational research. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, the Good sharing. The... Lakshmur, do you have any reflection, sir? Yeah, yeah. Sir, please. Sir, I have one, one point, which also the policy is talking about the allowing foreign educational institutions to you know, come into India and collaborate. Can you throw some light on that, sir? You know, we have uh, recommended that all the higher educational institutions ultimately have to move towards three classes of institutions. The first and higher class the research university. These are research universities where there is high grade teaching, but research is a kind of a importance, a 50 50 kind of a thing between teaching and research. And they are maybe a 100 or 200 of those kind of a thing in the next 20, 30 years. But most important is the fact that they promote research with good high level teaching. And they ultimately will turn out to be the kind of Ivy schools that you use in, see in US like MIT, Stanford and so on. Then the next one is an area where the teaching is an emphasis, but with research coexisting, because teaching and research go together and it improves the quality of the teaching through research people and research people benefit considerably by the students in terms of their originality and uh, uh, innovation and things like that. But these are called the second class. These are, these are universities at a level what you call the teaching universities. And the third is at autonomous degree giving colleges. These are undergraduate colleges. This will give degrees in a variety of subjects, but with liberal education as the foundational component in these colleges and then try to have the majors and minors as needed in the undergraduate education. So these three levels are going to have a certain time frame in which they will be established. It depends on the resources, financial, human, and other kinds of support that you need, and their infrastructure and so on. So it is having its own time frame. But instead of waiting for that kind of a time frame and the Indian system to get into the place, we can also provide a, a one more look of a direction in which similar systems have been already established and proven elsewhere. They come, they institute, they create those kind of institutions here, fulfill the type of goals that we have set up for their, uh, their, their research universities or teaching universities. And so that the kickstart can be done faster. So this is the whole idea that we can allow some of the, this allows only the best of the foreign universities, mind you, we are not talking about any, any type of university coming in. Best of the foreign, but, but it kickstarts the whole process much earlier than the time frame that we will have to establish this kind of a system and a structure uh, for the higher education institution. That is the main <coughs> thing. The second thing is, all the rules of the game also we need to learn and we can't be just experimenting internally to learn those. Once you bring in this kind of capability from outside, create institutions within from which we learn quite a lot, 
then the next steps from army to internally could be much better facilitated much easier done and much faster done than otherwise you were to do it all by learning from first principles so the other part of so these are the two reasons why we want to encourage investments from abroad with respect to universities from outside but they will be all judged by that there has to be a proper legislative framework which also has to be written down so this cannot be just an easy entry into the system so that legislative framework has to be work has to be done on that and we have to get the necessary clearances from the parliament and other institution to make sure that this is facilitated so this is the background for that thank you very much sir thank thank you, thank you sir I think yes, sir, one... I have one point, sir, uh, with regard to uh, uh, enabling the existing uh, colleges to get into autonomous degree awarding colleges in the next 15 years. And the next 15 years is a timeline that the policy provides. So now uh, in the next 15 years, uh, uh, the institutions are expected to get the autonomy in a graded way. One is academic autonomy, administrative autonomy, and finance autonomy. So now for this... Uh, uh, for an institution to become autonomous for degree awarding uh, in the span of 15 years, uh, there are certain enabling situations that are needed in the respective states, respective state governments, and the respective state universities to which the existing institutions are affiliated to. So in that context, sir, are there any uh, timelines that are given for the universities to bring, come up with the SOPs for enabling the, the capable private institutions to become autonomous? Uh, or when can we get these SOPs ready, sir? I think this is a part of the implementation plan. Each of the state can set up, for example, Karnataka. They are looking at this kind of a problem with respect to how quickly we can convert some of the colleges into autonomous or degree-giving colleges. And uh, the, whole, the whole thing depends, of course, you know, we have also restructured the regulatory system. You, you have a regulatory authority, you have an accreditation authority, you have a grants giving authority and a frame setting authority. There are four of them and they are all put integrated also to the National Education Commission at sure. the top. So now this will lay down procedures for this. You have you have a, a regulation and an accreditation and grant giving. They will land the framework setting. They will lay down the procedures and each state can adopt procedures which is most conducive and it can also be institution specific. For example, your institution is extremely keen to move into a de autonomous degree giving colleges in the next five years. What is needed is to make sure that you bring a multidisciplinarity culture in your system, integrate you, try to see whether you can bring even professional education and vocational education into your plan, into your, into your fold, besides the regular education. Uh, uh, mainstream education. So you, these elements are brought internally and you restructure internal system and then go to these revamped uh, system of a regulation. <clears throat> I don't think that there is any problem how fast you can be ready with a, uh, with a capability and your ability to move towards autonomous body institution can decide how fast you are able to get that accreditation. I don't think anybody will come in the way of that because the policy provides for an early transition into autonomous degree giving college. When in fact, the policy is even more anxious that these autonomous degree colleges should not be stuck as autonomous degree colleges. Once they cross something like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 students, and they have this multidisciplinarity culture and try to bring in liberal education into the uh, undergraduate education, they can start going into the higher education part of it, masters and PhD, and also start going into the teaching university stages and teaching university. So these are the, there is no hard no hard walls separating these kind of institution. It all depends on your performance, your re continuous reconfiguration of your capability, and what kind of stature do you enjoy among the communities over the education is concerned. This will automatically make you eligible for the next level and next level. So this is a time frame which you can set. You can show that you are capable of meeting the requirements. And those requirements, what is the, what is the curricular framework and things like that will now come out, as I mentioned. Once that is there and the regulatory bodies are in place, between the two, you can discuss and make sure that uh, this, this can be proceeded with. Uh, I don't think there need to be worry about the time frame, the time frame will not be set by the government. I think by people 
who promote these kind of institutions, they have the most important role to play of how quickly they can be ready with this kind of uh, approaches uh, in the new policy. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. There is a last question from our, from our group of this, uh, from Mr. Hari. Uh, he would like to know, uh, we would like to know the institution, the private institution like us, uh, if we raise to, uh, if you want to raise funds for further growth or uh, expansion, is there any particular guidelines uh, in the NEP? You mean funding? Sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Funding, uh, I, I directly investing from public funds into uh, this thing is one aspect of it on which we have not really touched. What is because the definition of private is that you have a private funding. The, what we have tried to emphasize is two, three things. One, you have a major research program and you want fund for research. And that research includes hiring people, creating some minimal infrastructure and many other kinds of support. I think whether you are a public or a private funded institute, you will get this. There will be no, currently, you know that there are differences, distinctions made between private institutes and public. So that part of it will be there. The second thing we have thought about is there are many areas where Facilities of large investments are available. And uh, here we want to make use of the fact that this, just for those kind of major facilities, a national facility. After all, you are all part of a national set of institutions. So they, you should get also the flexibility of using those facilities with minimal kind of a charges, which has run for mainly maintenance and running and things like operational kind of a thing. So operational, this is the second part. Third is major other things like, for example, there are in schools, one talks of playgrounds, libraries, and many other kinds of common facilities. Now, these are also can be shared between private and public. So there are many areas in which this kind of sharing of resources or getting funding for areas like research is possible. Uh, I, on the question of an, funding an institution itself through public money and call it a private institution, I am not very sure that we have addressed that question in that perspective. Our assumption is that uh, the private institutions or a public spirited institute, or what you may call as a philanthropic institution, they will make the necessary initial investment, create the core capabilities, and then on specific areas, they seek also the public funding supply. That is possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So now I request uh, Professor Raja Murugadas to deliver the vote of thanks. Sir, Barani, uh, one minute. Uh, any panelists have any other things to ask, sir? Any of our panelists? A any queries that you'd like to find? Thank you, sir. So, Raja, go ahead. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, at the outset, uh, uh, on behalf of the entire team of GMR Varlakshmi Foundation, uh, we are expressing a sincere gratitude and thankfulness for accepting our kindly, uh, kind of, uh, accepting our invitation to address this uh, uh, particular uh, topic uh, on national education policy. We are very much honored and privileged to have this session directly from your side, sir. We are very much fortunate, in fact, and your insights on the national education policy in continuation with the series of webinars what we had in the last uh, several months uh, definitely it reinforced now to a greater extent. In that aspect, we are very much fortunate. And coming to the policy, we are very much deeply impressed in the way the policy has been formulated uh, in the aspect of providing a holistic and multidisciplinary education uh, to all the students. And also we understand that the major emphasis has been given with the concept of STEM that is being blended with the 21st century skills like uh, communication, create critical thinking, collaboration, and uh, creativity. Hope this kind of policies will definitely bring a paradigm shift in the education sector in the coming days. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation. And uh, I thank all the participants. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, it is the responsibility of the academicians to take the policy forward to make uh, a kind of an effective deployment in the coming future. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants as well as uh, the esteemed guest, Badma uh, Vibhushan, uh, Dr. K. Kasturi Ranganji for accepting our invitation. Once again, thank you all. 
thank you very much sir. thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much thank you thank you also thank you panelists thank you sir esteemed speaker and all the participants thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you all thank you all yes sir meeting end chase istana uh thank you all so we are ending the meeting now thank, thank you, you bharni thank you bharni thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you all ఎందుకు సరే సరే